the book of Matthew, specifically chapter 24 colon 37-39, draws a cautionary parallel between the age of Noah and the second coming. This naturally leads one to ask, what was happening during Noah's time? The period known as the days of Noah is characterized not only by the well-known tale of torrential rains and an ark, but also by the emergence of the Nephilim. These beings were born from the union of celestial entities, often referred to as the sons of God, and earthly women. This unprecedented event led to the rise of the Nephilim, powerful beings significant in shaping a world teetering on the brink of spiritual and moral decay, a world of mighty men, evil imaginations, and overwhelming wickedness. The Bible highlights the figure of Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam, who walked in righteousness. Enoch, a prophet, is mentioned in the penultimate book of the Bible, the book of Jude. In this book, Jude references a prophecy from Enoch, underscoring the depth of his spiritual insight and significance in the biblical narrative. Jude 1 verses 14 to 15 states, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold the Lord cometh with ten thousand thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Enoch, a man who walked with God before the flood, never died but was taken by God. He was the father of Methuselah, the longest living man mentioned in the Bible. Enoch is listed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Luke and is recognized in Hebrews 11 verse 5 for his faith, pleasing God and taken up so that he would not see death. Living 365 years before being taken by God, Enoch, a solitary figure, saw 5,000 years into the future and witnessed the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with tens of thousands of his saints as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is depicted as coming to execute judgment. Some groups attribute Enoch as the author of the Book of Enoch, regarded by some as an authoritative and accurate depiction of the world before the Flood, known as the Antediluvian Period. While I personally adhere only to the Bible as my 100% source of truth, there are aspects of the Book of Enoch that align with the Holy Bible. The sixth chapter of the Book of Genesis offers significant insight into the Antediluvian Period the days before the flood. Described in Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4, the Nephilim are introduced amidst increasing wickedness on earth before the great flood. The passage narrates how the sons of God found the daughters of men beautiful and married them as they chose. The offspring of these unions were the Nephilim, often characterized as giants or mighty warriors of old. The world before the flood was in a state of chaos and disorder marked by angels abandoning their rightful abodes. Notable disturbances occurred on earth and in the spiritual realm during that time. Hey, before we begin I would appreciate if you would like the video, so that you can help me to continue spreading Christian messages. If you are not subscribed I recommend you to subscribe and activate the bell, so you don't miss any video that are uploaded every day. Alright, let's keep rolling. Genesis 6 verses 5 to 8 emphasizes the wickedness of man, leading to God's decision to destroy man, beast, creeping thing, and fowls of the air. Yet, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These were the days of Noah, in the book of Matthew, specifically 24 37-39, touches upon this age of Noah, emphasizing a cautionary parallel between those times and the second coming. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This passage has sparked numerous interpretations and debates among theologians and Bible scholars. The most widely accepted interpretation of Matthew 24 verses 37 to 39 among Bible scholars is the suddenness of judgment. This view emphasizes that the return of Christ will be unexpected, surprising many, similar to the flood in Noah's time. I'll delve into this interpretation towards the end of the sermon. 
However, there are many other interpretations and notable parallels with our present day. One such parallel is the spiritual and supernatural aspect of Noah's days, the rise in supernatural activity. This interpretation focuses on the rise of supernatural activity, as described in Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4. It serves as a stark reminder of a world overwhelmed by wickedness, warranting divine intervention on an unprecedented scale. The involvement of the sons of God with human women led to the rise of the Nephilim, a subject of intense debate and study among theologians and biblical scholars for centuries. The concept that celestial beings or spirit entities could directly interfere in human affairs, resulting in the birth of a hybrid race, is as intriguing as it is alarming. Proponents of this interpretation suggest that the account of the rise of the Nephilim is not merely a historical record but may also have prophetic implications regarding the state of the world leading up to significant divine interventions, such as the return of Christ. Just as the world before the flood experienced a surge in supernatural activity and evil, some argue that the end times will witness a similar increase in demonic influences. This perspective challenges us to consider the spiritual climate of our present day. Are we witnessing a rise in supernatural activity, and are we attentive to the signs of the times? The days of Noah serve as a cautionary tale, prompting us to reflect on the moral and spiritual conditions of our era. As we explore these parallels, it's crucial to engage in a thoughtful and discerning examination of the scriptures, seeking understanding and wisdom. The narrative in Genesis reminds us that the days before the flood were marked by a profound moral decay, with every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart being only evil continually. It grieved the Lord that he had made man, and he decided to bring judgment upon the earth. In the midst of this darkness, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The contrast between the prevailing wickedness and Noah's righteousness highlights the significance of individual faith and devotion to God in the face of societal decline. Noah's obedience in building the ark, despite the ridicule and mockery he likely faced, serves as a testament to his unwavering faith. The ark itself becomes a symbol of salvation, providing refuge from the impending judgment. In the same way, the Bible teaches that faith in Jesus Christ is our refuge and salvation in the midst of a world facing spiritual challenges and uncertainties. As we consider these parallels between Noah's days and the present, it's essential to acknowledge the relevance of spiritual discernment. In a world filled with distractions and competing voices, cultivating a discerning spirit becomes crucial. The scriptures guide us in understanding the signs of the times and navigating the complexities of the spiritual landscape. Returning to the interpretation of Matthew 24 verses 37 to 39, which emphasizes the suddenness of judgment, we find a call to readiness and vigilance. Just as the people in Noah's time were caught unaware by the flood, there is a sobering reminder for us to be prepared for the unexpected return of Christ. This readiness involves not only anticipating his return but also living in accordance with his teachings and commandments. The days of Noah, with their moral decay and divine intervention, serve as a powerful backdrop to Jesus' words in Matthew. They prompt us to reflect on our own lives, the state of our communities, and the broader world. Are we, like Noah, finding grace in the eyes of the Lord amid the challenges of our time? Are we actively seeking righteousness and obedience to God's will? The narrative of Noah also underscores the truth that God's judgment is not arbitrary but is based on the moral choices of individuals and societies. The wickedness and corruption that pervaded Noah's generation led to divine intervention. This raises important questions for us today. How do our moral choices and societal values align with God's standards? Are we contributing to a culture of righteousness, or are we succumbing to the prevailing trends of moral compromise? In exploring these questions, it's crucial to approach the scriptures with humility and a genuine desire for understanding. The Word of God serves as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, guiding us in discerning the times and making righteous choices. As we navigate the complexities of the present age, let us draw inspiration from the faithfulness of Noah who, against all odds, remained obedient and found favor in God's eyes. 
the book of Matthew's cautionary parallel between the days of Noah and the second coming invites us to introspection and spiritual preparedness. It challenges us to consider the moral and spiritual climate of our times and align our lives with the teachings of Christ. The narrative of Noah serves as both a warning and an encouragement, reminding us that amid societal challenges and uncertainties, God remains faithful to those who seek Him. The days of Noah offer profound lessons for us today. They teach us about the consequences of moral decay, the significance of individual faithfulness, and the need for spiritual discernment. As we navigate the complexities of our era, let us be like Noah, finding grace in the eyes of the Lord and actively pursuing righteousness. The parallel drawn in Matthew 24 verses 37 to 39 serves as a timeless reminder to be vigilant, prepared, and anchored in the unchanging truth of God's word. May we heed this call and live in anticipation of the glorious second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's dive into some deep waters, exploring the intriguing link between the days of Noah and what's happening right under our noses today. You see, it's not just about a historical tale of floods and arcs, it's about a cosmic clash of good and evil, a tug of war between the supernatural and the earthly. The book of Matthew, specifically chapter 24 37-39, throws us a curveball, drawing parallels between Noah's time and the second coming. Now, hold on tight, because this ain't your average Sunday school story. We're talking about a time when the spiritual and the physical collided, giving birth to creatures known as the Nephilim, a fusion of the divine and the mortal. And it's not just Matthew dropping hints. Other parts of the good book talk about a surge in supernatural activity in the last days. Take 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, for example. It straight up says that in the latter times, some folks will bail on the faith, lured by seductive spirits and devilish doctrines. Sounds like a blockbuster plot, right? Now, fast forward to our current reality. Google searches about the Nephilim are skyrocketing. It's like people are on a supernatural quest, seeking answers to the unexplainable mysteries that surround us. In a world buzzing with tales of strange phenomena, ancient texts, and biblical narratives are making a comeback. The Nephilim, those enigmatic beings from the Bible, bridge the gap between the earthly and the divine, the physical and the spiritual. Our curiosity is on overdrive. We're not just binge-watching Netflix, we're binge-reading ancient texts, trying to connect the dots. And it's not just a Sunday sermon topic, it's hitting the mainstream, from movies and books to TV series, the supernatural is all the rage. But here's the kicker, it's not just a trend or a pop culture fascination. Reports are pouring in from all corners of the globe about unexplainable encounters. People claim to have brushed shoulders with entities that don't play by the rules of our natural world. It's like we're living in a Marvel movie, but this time, the superheroes and villains are not just on the screen, they're making cameo appearances in our lives. And it's not just the common folk, even law enforcement is raising its eyebrows. Imagine a police officer walking up to a preacher, saying, Hey, what you're preaching? Spot on. I've seen things on duty that would make your head spin, objects moving when no one's around, swarms of flies invading homes, and people pulling off stunts that defy the laws of physics. Now, take a moment to absorb this, large groups of people witnessing shadowy creatures, whispers in the night, in an air so thick you could cut it with a knife. It's like the spirit world is throwing a blockbuster party on Earth, and we're all invited, whether we like it or not. But here's where it gets real, and it might send a chill down your spine. Children, innocent and pure, caught in the crossfire. Speaking languages they've never learned, displaying knowledge that defies logic. It's like a spiritual tsunami, and these little ones are surfing the waves. Just like the days of Noah, when an Nephilim made their mark, influencing cultures and steering humanity away from the Almighty. Now, let's hit the brakes for a moment. This isn't some sci-fi novel, it's today's headlines. There's a surge in spiritual warfare, reports of possessions, intense battles in the supernatural realm, 
and the pervasive influence of not-so-friendly spiritual entities. It's like we're living in the pre-flood era all over again. So, what's the deal with Matthew 24 verses 37 to 39? Why is Jesus comparing his second coming to the days of Noah? Picture this, life going on as usual, folks eating, drinking, getting hitched, daily grind stuff. Jesus isn't dissing the mundane, he's warning us not to get too comfy in our routines. It's like the calm before the storm, and we're all just chilling in the eye of it. Noah wasn't just building an ark, he was sounding the alarm. But, let's be real, his neighbors weren't throwing him high fives. They laughed it off, called him crazy, and carried on with their business as usual. Until, of course, the raindrops turned into a flood, and their laughter turned into desperate cries for help. And here's the kicker, history repeats itself. Just as people shrugged off Noah's warnings, we're doing the same today. We're so caught up in our Netflix binges, daily grinds, and weekend plans that we're missing the signs. It's a wake-up call to stay spiritually woke, my friends. Jesus said, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Translation, it's business as usual until it's not. Just like nobody knows when they'll clock out of this life, we won't see the Son of Man's return coming. Now, let's rewind to Noah's time. Humanity went off the rails, ditching God's rule book for a life of indulgence. Pleasure became king, morality went out the window, and it was a spiritual and moral free fall. The aftermath? Generations marred by the consequences of their choices. Fast forward again, are we on the same track? Are we choosing pleasure over principle, convenience over conviction? It's a slippery slope, my friends. The days of Noah weren't just about a flood, they were about a society that lost its moral compass. And we're standing at a similar crossroads today. So, here's the bottom line, don't get too cozy in the daily grind. Stay vigilant, keep an eye on the signs, and don't let the spiritual blockbuster playing out around us catch you off guard. The return of the Son of Man, like the flood in Noah's time, will be sudden, unexpected, and potentially life-changing. In the grand scheme of things, we're characters in a cosmic drama, and the stage is set for the ultimate showdown. Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, the signs are there. The supernatural is knocking on our door, and the question is, are we ready to face it? So, grab your popcorn, buckle up, and let's navigate this wild ride called life with our eyes wide open. All right, buckle up, folks. We're about to unravel a tale that goes beyond Goliath, the heavyweight champion of the Philistines. Imagine a time when giants roamed the earth, not just Goliath, but a whole league of them. These weren't your average folks, they were towering titans, legends etched in the annals of time. Now, let's rewind to Noah's time, a time of moral decay, where folks went about their business as if everything was hunky-dory. It's a stark reminder that looks can be deceiving, my friends. Our world today is no different. We've got people cruising through life, hiking, enjoying scenic views, going on dates, catching blockbuster movies, and celebrating every occasion on the calendar. But here's the kicker, judgment is looming, and most of them are blissfully unaware. Spiritual blindness was a thing in Noah's era, and guess what? It's still a thing today. People were so caught up in the allure of sin and personal desires that they missed the memo on repentance and reconciliation with the big guy upstairs. It's like they've put on spiritual blindfolds, enjoying their normal lives while a storm of judgment is brewing on the horizon. Now, let's shift gears a bit. Picture this, the true story of Goliath. We all know the name, right? But what if I told you Goliath wasn't a lone wolf? Nope, he had a squad, a league of giant brothers, each with a story as intriguing as the next. Goliath, the Philistine, was no ordinary dude. He stepped onto the battlefield like a one-man wrecking crew, 
his armor weighing as much as a small car, and his spear, well, it could double as a tree trunk. The dude was over nine feet tall, making him the Shaquille O'Neal of biblical times. But here's the twist, Goliath wasn't the only giant in town. Nah, he had brothers, and their stories are hidden gems in the Bible. Giants in their own right, they walked among us, leaving their colossal mark on the pages of history. Now, fasten your seatbelts as we journey through 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles. We're digging into the lives and deaths of these enigmatic figures, questioning assumptions, and unraveling the sequences of their origins. It's a biblical roller coaster, my friends, and you're in for a ride. Let's kick it off with the heavyweight champ himself, Goliath. Picture a battlefield, the Philistines on one side, Israelites on the other, and in the middle stands Goliath, a giant among giants. This dude's armor alone could give Hercules a run for his money, brass helmet, coat, greaves, and a spear that would make a javelin champion jealous. He was the Philistines' go-to guy, their champion, a symbol of strength and intimidation. The Philistines, throughout biblical history, were like the recurring rivals in a TV show. They were always giving the Israelites a hard time, and Goliath was their ace in the hole. His challenge to the Israelites was no joke. It wasn't just about physical combat, it was a psychological warfare game changer. Now, let's peel back the layers and get to the nitty gritty of Goliath's family tree. Did you know he had brothers? Oh yeah, this was no solo act. His kin, also giants, rocked the biblical stage. As we explore 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles, we'll uncover their tales, question their identities, and maybe even ponder if they were Nephilim, the supposed offspring of angels and humans. Goliath, the Philistine powerhouse, set the stage for a legendary showdown with a young shepherd named David. But hold on, we're not done yet. Stay tuned as we dig deeper into the giant saga, unraveling the mysteries that lie beyond Goliath. Giants, brothers, battles, it's a biblical blockbuster, and you're front and center for the show. So, grab your popcorn, kick back, and join me on this journey through the biblical battlegrounds, where giants once walked and legends were born. We're about to uncover a chapter in history that's as colossal as the giants themselves. Get ready for a tale that goes beyond the headlines and deep into the heart of the biblical narrative. The giants may be long gone, but their stories echo through the ages, waiting to be heard once again. Alright, let's dive into the captivating tale of giants, brothers, and biblical showdowns. Now, back in 2009, the Guinness World Records crowned Sultan Kassan as the tallest man, standing at a towering 8 feet and 3 inches. Sounds impressive, right? But hold your horses because, in the ancient realm, Goliath, the Philistine champion, dwarfed even the tallest recorded man, measuring a colossal nine feet and more. Goliath wasn't just a giant, he was a walking fortress, decked out in a 125-pound bronze armor, a helmet, coat of mail, and the whole shebang. This guy was like the Iron Man of biblical times. Picture this, a colossal warrior armed with a massive bronze javelin, a shield-bearer, and an aura of sheer intimidation. The Israelites? Well, they were quaking in their sandals. Goliath threw down the gauntlet, proposing a deal that would make or break the Israelites, a winner-takes-all scenario. Now, this wasn't a walk in the park. Goliath's challenge plunged the Israelite army into 40 days of sheer paralysis. Even King Saul, the big shot, was shaking in his royal sandals. Enter David, a young shepherd with a heart bigger than his sling. Despite being a rookie in military service, David was deeply offended by Goliath's disrespect for the God of Israel. Motivated by faith, this shepherd volunteered to face the giant. Initially met with skepticism, David's recount of fending off predators from his flock convinced Saul. Armed with nothing but a sling and stone, David stepped up to the plate against Goliath's arsenal of sword, spear, and shield. What happened next was straight out of an epic movie script. 
David, fueled by unwavering faith, slung a stone, striking Goliath right where it hurts. With the giant incapacitated, David seized the moment, using Goliath's own sword to finish the job. Cue the Philistine army scrambling in disarray, and the Israelites claiming victory. Now, here's the plot twist, Goliath had brothers. Yup, you heard it right. Goliath wasn't a solo act. He had a squad of giants. According to the scriptures, Goliath had four relatives, and they weren't just your average Joes. These guys were giants like him, with equally terrifying physiques. The Bible doesn't go into explicit details about their relationship, but it's clear they were Goliath's kin. Fast forward to the battles that ensued. David, now a giant slaying hero, faced off against Goliath's relatives. The biblical battlegrounds were alive with clashes between the Israelites and the Philistines, a saga that unfolded during David's reign. Giants with names like Ishbidnab, Saf, and a dude with six fingers and six toes on each hand and foot entered the scene. Sounds like something out of a fantasy novel, right? David and his men, the unsung heroes of the biblical realm, took on these giants, defeating them one by one. The saga unfolds in 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles, chronicling the epic battles and the end of Goliath's formidable kin. Ishbidnab, Saf, the six-fingered dude, all giants, all defeated by David and his crew. Now, let's address the elephant in the room, were these giants Nephilim? The Nephilim, shrouded in mystery, are briefly mentioned in Genesis 6 verse 4. Some theories suggest they were the offspring of fallen angels and human women. But, surprise surprise, the Bible doesn't explicitly call Goliath and his brothers Nephilim. Instead, it points towards them being descendants of the Philistines, historically linked to the Anakim. Goliath's hometown, Gath, was a stronghold of these folks. So, there you have it, a tale of giants, brothers, and biblical battles that unfold like a Hollywood blockbuster. Whether it's David slinging stones or facing off against six-finger giants, this narrative is an action-packed roller coaster. These accounts, though ancient, speak to the extraordinary diversity in God's creation. And as we wrap up this epic journey, remember, sometimes, it takes a shepherd with faith to bring down a giant. Stay tuned for more biblical adventures and untold stories that echo through the ages. Let's embark on a journey into the intriguing realm of biblical mysteries, where questions about the Nephilim weave through the tapestry of ancient narratives. Now, there's this captivating viewpoint suggesting that fallen angels, captivated by the beauty of human women, engaged in some celestial mingling, resulting in the birth of the Nephilim, a hybrid mix of human and angelic genes. But hold your horses, this theory isn't without its fair share of controversies. You see, there's a bit of a tussle in scholarly circles. While some are on board with the idea of angels getting cozy with humans, others argue for a less supernatural interpretation. They propose that the so-called sons of God were just descendants of Seth, you know, good old Adam's third son. And the daughters of men were from the ungodly line of Cain. But here's the catch, this perspective struggles to explain the extraordinary size and nature of the Nephilim. I mean, we're talking about beings that were way beyond your average human attributes. Despite the academic wrestling match, the prevailing view tends to lean towards the Nephilim being the offspring of these celestial human unions. It just fits the bill when you consider their depicted attributes and the overarching supernatural themes in the biblical narrative. Genesis 4 verses 25 to 26 even throws in a nugget about Seth, Adam's son, having a son named Enos, and that's where the plot thickens. Now, let's fast forward a bit and address a question that often tickles curious minds, are there descendants of the Nephilim wandering around today? This inquiry takes root in Genesis 6 verse 4, where it's mentioned that these supernatural beings existed both before and after the flood. But wait! The flood was supposed to wipe the slate clean, right? Noah's family was the chosen few to repopulate the earth and restore some righteousness. 
So, how on earth could the Nephilim make a comeback after being wiped out in a flood? Here's where it gets interesting. Post-flood, we encounter mentions of giant-like beings, such as the Anakim or the Reem, sparking debates about a potential Nephilim lineage. But hold your horses, these groups are distinct and shouldn't be mixed up with the Nephilim from the antediluvian world. Theological alarm bells start ringing here, questioning the survival of a Nephilim lineage after the flood. It seems like divine judgment and cleansing were on the agenda, and the Nephilim were part of the package deal. Digging deeper into the biblical evidence and theological context, the idea that there are descendants of the Nephilim today doesn't stand on solid ground. The post-flood references to giant-like beings aren't directly linked to the Nephilim, and the narrative doesn't paint a picture of their lineage persisting beyond the flood. It's like they had their moment in the sun, or rather, pre-flood earth, and then faded into biblical history. But, hey, don't let the absence of Nephilim descendants reign on your biblical parade. The Nephilim were more like a specific spice in the grand recipe of human history, appearing in a limited period before the Great Flood. And that, my friends, adds a layer of mystery to the biblical narrative. Now, before we wrap up this biblical roller coaster, ponder on the enigma of the Nephilim. Were they celestial human hybrids, remnants of a pre flood era, or just an ancient myth that fueled theological debates? As we delve into these questions, Remember, the Bible is a tapestry of tales that continues to captivate and intrigue, offering glimpses into the mysteries of our ancient past. Stay tuned for more biblical escapades and untold stories that echo through the ages. Venture with me into the intriguing world of the Nephilim, a term that has evolved into denoting giant warriors, shrouded in enigma and awe. Picture it like the transformation of the term Titan, once the pre-Olympian gods in Greek mythology, now a symbol of immense scale or significance, like a monumental achievement or a towering structure. Now, back to the Nephilim. They were, according to ancient lore, colossal enigmatic warriors, their origins and genetic makeup draped in speculation. Considering our limited grasp of the term, it seems they were exceptional beings, perhaps even verging on the mythological, akin to the giants of ancient tales or powerful mythical entities. But here's the kicker, since the Nephilim were mentioned after the Flood, could they still exist today? Well, that's a riddle that depends on which school of thought you're vibing with regarding their origin. In the Book of Numbers, they make a cameo, but personally, I'm leaning towards the idea that Nephilim don't walk among us today, and they met their demise in the Flood. Why? Well, simple, there's silch evidence of Nephilim roaming around in our modern era. Imagine if they were still kicking, that'd stir up a whole cauldron of questions. Can their descendants be saved? Are they hybrids of humans and angels, and if so, does that affect their salvation status? The Bible stays pretty mum on angels having a savior, and Jesus isn't exactly the go-to guy for them, according to Hebrews 2 verses 14 to 17. Now, if you flip the script to Deuteronomy 2 verses 20 to 21, Moses gives us a little history lesson. He spills the tea on how God wiped out the Nephilim in the land of Ammon. That was a land of giants, but the Lord took care of business. No more Nephilim, case closed. But wait, there's more, the fallen angels, the supposed parents of the Nephilim, caught a divine judgment according to Jude 1 verse 6. They left their own habitation so God decided to reserve them in everlasting chains under darkness until Judgment Day. Talk about a plot twist. In conclusion, when we weigh the biblical evidence and dip into some theological understanding, it seems like the Nephilim or their descendants aren't strutting around in the world today. The scriptures, from Genesis to Revelation, unfold a narrative of a God who's steering the ship of history, dishing out judgments when needed, and having a master plan for humanity, one that hits its peak in redemption through Jesus Christ. So, fascinating as the Nephilim topic is, it's a reminder of the grander truths in Scripture, sin's reality, the need for salvation, and the hope we find in Christ. As believers, our gaze should stay fixed on these foundational truths, 
finding comfort and assurance in the sovereignty and love of God, the mastermind behind the whole show, steering everything according to his flawless will. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share with your friends so we can keep making them. For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.